This podcast is a part of the Carbon Almanac Network of Podcasts. Hey, Gen Z Changemakers. This is Generation Carbon, the podcast where kids like you help grownups like us save the planet. Gen Z Changemakers, we'd love you to get involved. If you'd like to submit your super scientific findings in a future episode, we need Gen Z science-minded story reporters on the climate case. Have your grownups visit carbonalmanac.org slash kids to sign up. Today's Science Spark comes from our Gen Z changemaker, Matilda. Hello, my name is Matilda. I eight years old and I live in Bologna, Italy. How is it possible there is so much plastic in the ocean? How did the plastic get there? Has someone thrown it in the sea? Who? Why? Three, two, one, ready or not, here I come. Come and find me. I know. I'll head straight to Uncle Octopus's milk crate. <laughs> Nobody, I mean nobody, will find me inside of his house. This disposable diaper is perfect. They'll never find me under here. Uncle Octopus, you home? It's Professor Walrus. Here I come, Professor Walrus. Just tidying up lunch. Hey, Professor. What can I do for you? Well, as you know, I started volunteering at the Department of Plastic Wellness C Division here in Octopolis. And I'm swimming around today knocking on doors of homes in stage 4 level of plastic deterioration, in which the plastic is breaking down into microplastics. And I came to alert you that your milk crate home has in fact reached level 4 dangerous. Breaking down? I've lived here for, oh, it's oh, a good job, I've got eight tentacles, oh, I, I've lived here 22 years, and it's been a great home, it's perfectly safe, very sturdy, I've never had a single piece of plastic break off, not one single piece, in fact. I understand, and it's a lovely home, but this is actually not safe. For one, it could break and hurt you. It also might start to leak some chemicals over time, which were used to make the plastic. Those might make you feel sick. We at the Department of Plastic Wellness C Division think you should find a new home right away. And it's a lovely day, Professor. Ick? Sick? I have to help. I know. I'll sneak out the back. been swimming and searching and searching and swimming and swimming and searching and and searching. Why is it easier to find human garbage than seashells? Maybe I should just give up. Yoo-hoo! Octopuppy, over here. Edie? Boy, am I glad to see you. What are you doing down here? We're studying the ocean floor as part of nature school. What are you doing so far away from Octopolis? Oh, Edie. Professor Walrus came in to warn us that Uncle Octopus's home is breaking down. I'm not surprised. The ocean plastics are a real problem. I'm on a mission to find the perfect shell. You know, like back in the olden days before there was so much human garbage. But shells are so rare these days and I've been searching all over. A shell? 
a shell. I learned today that human garbage does not make safe homes for us, but Uncle Octopus won't leave. Maybe if I find him the perfect shell. Hey, wait a minute. I have a big shell in my scuba bucket. I wonder if it would work. I'll go grab it. Really? Thanks, Edie. Well, what do you think? It's, it's incredible. It's so shiny and big. Woohoo! Hello. You better believe it'll work. It's perfect. It's, it's octo perfect. But I'd better get back before they start to worry. Thanks so much, Edie. I can't wait to show Uncle Octopus. Oh. Oh. Professor Walrus. Professor Walrus, I really appreciate your help. But. Octopoppy? Hey, Uncle Octopus! Check out what I brought for you. What a beautiful shell! Where on earth did you find it? I went looking for one for you. I heard Professor Walrus earlier, and I don't want you to be unsafe. I know you're cozy here, but please, Uncle Octopus, this shell wouldn't let chemicals out or, or break in the way that plastic garbage could. Oh, please say that you'll think about it. I'll move in tomorrow. You will? You will? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Octopoppy. It's perfect. You got it, Unc. Octopoppy? Wow! Best hiding spot ever. We've been looking all over for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Matilda. Thank you for the wonderful question. My name is Nathan Robinson. I am a marine biologist and an ocean activist, and my work focuses on protecting marine animals, such as sea turtles, from the dangers of plastic pollution. In fact, you might have seen some of my research before, as I had a video go viral back in 2015. In this video, I was filmed removing a plastic drinking straw from the nostril of a sea turtle. Before I answer your wonderful questions, I would like to commend you for first, your wonderful English, and secondly, your courage in asking a question in a language that isn't your native tongue. So, great stuff. The question you posed, how is it possible to have so much plastic in the ocean? How did it get there? And did someone throw it there? Is a wonderful question that requires a little bit of explanation. Firstly, all plastic on this planet has been produced by humans. There's no other animal apart from us that produces plastic. So all the plastic that is currently in our environment is our responsibility. Now, we haven't purposefully thrown it in the oceans. Generally speaking, we don't. What we've tried to do is try to dispose of it in other ways. We might have put it into landfills or, um, or things similar to that. The problem is plastic does not naturally break down the same way that uh, organic compounds, apple cores or other food breaks down naturally. Plastic remains and it's expected that it might even remain in almost exactly the same form that it is now for up to a thousand years or even more. So what happens is as we're producing all this plastic to sustain our modern lifestyles, to wrap our foods, to build our cars, to do whatever we need to do with it, that is increasing, continually increasing the amount of plastic on the planet. The problem is where that plastic goes next. If we dispose of it in crypt ways, then the first option is that it gets recycled. So it gets turned into another form of plastic and reused again. But some plastics we can't or don't currently have the technology to recycle. Instead, we put them, or tend to put them in landfill. 
This basically means we dig a big hole in the ground and we dump the plastic there. Now, the plastic will last because that plastic does not biodegrade, so it will permanently stay in the ground, far beyond the lifespan of anyone alive on the planet today. Unfortunately, not just when we put stuff in landfill, not all of it stays in landfill. And we're not perfect at trying to get our plastic waste from, say, trash cans in our house to, to landfill sites. And often we have huge amounts of pollution. Now, some of this is maybe, I'll call it intentional, but this just might be someone walking down the street and not throwing away a plastic wrapper. And then other times it might actually be countries dumping their plastic directly into the ocean. Many countries around the world for many, many years, their solution to the problem of waste buildup was simply chuck it in the ocean and it's someone else's problem. That plastic is continuing to accumulate every single year and will continue to accumulate until we do something about it. And this doesn't just mean reducing the amount of plastic that we're currently producing. This also means we need to start thinking of ways to take the plastic that's already in our oceans out. Unless we do that, that plastic is still going to remain there for millions of years. And in fact, large pieces of plastic eventually break down into what we call microplastics, which can be even more dangerous to marine life than the large chunks of plastic. Chemically, it's the same. It's like getting a bit of paper and tiring it into smaller and smaller pieces. The smaller it is, the harder it is to take out of the environment and the easier it is for marine animals to ingest it. So the final layer to my answer to the question would be to start saying, who are the biggest culprits in creating plastic pollution? There are a couple of huge key players in causing the plastic pollution in our oceans right now. And several of them are the large organizations, companies such as Coca-Cola, that produce tons and tons of bottles, never ever, <clears throat> and aren't actively promoting recycling of these plastic bottles. Now, these aren't the organizations who are dumping the plastic, but they're the organizations that are creating plastic. And there's also another very less discussed problem. And this is the problem of discarded fishing gear. So when fishing boats go out to the ocean and they start fishing for fish with their nets, often if that net gets caught or torn, those nets just get thrown back into the ocean. And in fact, the largest, in terms of weight, the largest abundance of plastic debris in the ocean comes out of discarding, discarded fishing gear. So another wonderful way to start to protect our oceans is to su start supporting initiatives that are trying to ensure that, say, fishing nets aren't discarded, or there's some wonderful institutions that are actually taking those fishing nets back out of the ocean if they find them, say, just drifting and turning them into other things. This might be recycling them into their base materials so they can be turned into other plastics. There's some wonderful organizations that actually take the, the fishing nets and turn them into things like bracelets that can then be set, sold to support other initiatives. So I hope that provides some answer to your absolutely wonderful question. I hope you're having a great day and I wish you all the best. And now for a submission from our super scientific story reporter, Giselle from Chicago, Illinois, USA. Giselle has some insight into what's going on in our oceans and some ideas on how we can reduce our plastic use. Is there plastic in the ocean? Why? Is it hurting the animals? Plastic in the ocean is a big problem that most adults don't talk about enough. Plastic in the ocean has caused many problems, from the way marine life lives to harming the coral reef. We as a society have gotten so used to using plastic just because it's convenient to us, but did you know you are also harming many animals? Think about your favorite marine animal, cuddly, cute, swimming around minding its own business, right? Sure, we'd like to think that way, but not for long. The amount of plastic waste they're eating and getting tangled in is harming their natural way of life. 
Animals in the ocean get trapped in the plastic rings that come from packaging your soda cans or water bottles together. These animals easily mistake plastic waste for their food. Their bodies can't digest plastic, so they either live with painful tummy aches or unfortunately die because they can't digest the plastic. It's not pretty, and it's time we teach each other how to help. A fact is that, by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Some ways you can help is by cutting down on the use of plastic you use. Example, plastic plates, plastic utensils, plastic straws, and plastic cups. And when you shop, you could buy less plastic and bring a reusable bag. Marine biologist Nathan said even when humans try to throw plastics away in the right places, it's so strong and it lasts so long that it will be around for a, a g- gajillion, trillion, quadrillion, octadecillion, quintavin, bl- billion years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think he said about a thousand years, Octopuppy. But I see your point. It lasts for a very, very long time. Sounds like it's going to take big changes to use less plastic. Like from the people up top. Yeah, it sounds like we gotta get those bigger companies to agree. Why don't we just ask them? Great idea, Octopoppy. Let's ask them. Our action plan for today is... Write a letter to a big company that produces lots of plastic and ask them to please find another safer material to use instead. Ask a grown-up to help you find the right address and send it off. Hi, my name is Leon. I'm six years old. I live in Canada. In 2050, I think the lights will take their energy from plants. Je m'appelle Leon. J'ai six ans. J'habite au Canada. Je crois que les lumières vont fonctionner avec des plantes en 2050. Thanks this week to Matilda for her science spark and Giselle for her super scientific story reporting. And thank you to Leon, who let us know what he thinks life in 2050 might look like. Also thanks to Nathan J. Robinson, marine biologist and science communicator at Wild Blue Science. To follow along with Nathan and witness an ever-growing diversity of inspiring wildlife and get a look at some of his best animal encounters, check out Wild Blue Science on YouTube and Instagram. And for more conversations about carbon and how you can help, head over to thecarbonalmanac.org. There are other podcasts in the network for grown-ups and lots of fun resources for Gen Z changemakers like you. It's a scary topic, but we've got you covered because together we can make change happen. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Until then, let's change the world, changemakers. makers.